Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today is the 1st of January 2020, the first day of a brand new decade, and I think as such, it is the perfect day to start a brand new series on getting started in Black Powder Napoleonics. And not just getting started, but on developing an army project from the drawing board to the tabletop. Hopefully, by the 31st of December this year, my project will be finished and I'll have a brand new army started from scratch. So if you want to join me in this journey, then please jump in and hopefully it'll give you some inspiration or ideas or help for your own journey into the world of Napoleonic black powder. So the first question that I think needs answering is what has attracted me to Napoleonic gaming in general? And is there something specific about one of the armies that is in the Napoleonic period. So for instance, if I really like, say, the film Waterloo, and I love the attack of the French Imperial Guard, then I probably want to be looking more towards a French army, maybe specialising in the Imperial Guard. Or if I recently watched The War and Peace on the BBC, and I really liked the story of those stoic Russians and the mining nobility that led them, then maybe I'd be looking more towards... A Russian army. Now this is obviously a very personal thing individually I, there's no right or wrong answers here it's very much what you like. It might be that you like colourful uniforms it might be that there's a particular personality who you really like. It might be that you like Napoleon in, himself or the Duke of Wellington or Blucher or Kutuzov or anything like that. It could be even that you enjoy a fictional character. It might be that you really like Sharp so you want to collect an army that includes the 95th of foot. Whatever it is, don't ever let anyone tell you that you're wrong or you're daft or that you shouldn't be interested in this, that or the other. If you're interested in it, then that's good enough for me. And that, for me, is the crucial part of collecting an army. Because let's remember, you're going to spend a lot of time, effort and money on this army. And if it's not something that you're passionate about, then... It's going to be twice as hard for you to get this project finished. Now, one of the things I hear a lot of people say online, and I could not disagree more, is they say, you know, people say, you know, oh, I want to get interested in Napoleonic gaming, but I don't know what army to get. And people say, well, what's everyone else got? Get something that can fight those armies. Now, I think, to be fair, I think that is meant as advice in... Uh, you know, it, it's uh, meant with goodwill. I don't think anyone's trying to mislead anyone, anything like that. But I think it's a disastrous thing to say. Because it's going to end up with you collecting an army that you don't really want to collect. But it's just the one that no one else has got. So my first ever black powder game, I used my French. And my opponent also used French. And the reason was that I, I didn't, I, I just took my French, and we, we didn't talk about what armies we were going to use, actually, we probably should have done beforehand. But, we had a French on French game, really enjoyed it. It helped me learn the special rules for the French, because obviously my opponent was using them as well. And, historically, I wrote it off as being in the training camps in 1804, or 1804, 1805. It was a core exercise of two divisions fighting each other and you know it was just a training exercise you can write it off as that quite easily so don't worry about what everyone else has got it is a, a consideration but for your first army i'd completely throw it out the window i would say go for the army that draws you to it think of why you want to do napoleonic gaming what's brought what's drawn you to the period and go with that so, in my case, one of the things I love about Napoleonic Wargaming is the sheer spectacle of it. Having loads of figures on the table, having you know different brightly coloured uniforms, things like that. So, realistically, there's not necessarily a limit on the armies there, because it, it's the spectacle, and all the armies have loads of men and colourful uniforms. And maybe, not, maybe not so much the Austrians, but uh, they've certainly got loads of men, just not very colourful uniforms. So that's not a huge amount of help there, but uh, that's okay. That's the fundamental that draws me to it. So we can then move on to the next question. 
The next question for me is going to be cost and availability and also ease of transport. Now, that's a bit weird that I've added that third one, but don't worry, it sort of comes into the first one of those as well. It comes into cost, and I'll uh, I'll break that down in a second. Uh, but the middle one, ease of availability, it's, it's a funny one. In this day of the internet, there is absolutely no problem getting hold of figures if you're willing to wait for them. I've recently had a Kickstarter that I backed uh, deliver just before Christmas. That came from Spain. My secret Napoleonic Army project has arrived from America. General Andy doesn't know anything about this. He knows that I'm working on something, but he doesn't know what. So hopefully towards the spring of this year, in addition to the army that I'm starting for this project, I'll also be doing the secret army project. So, that, that sorry, that came from America. That was the point of me telling you that story. Um, so getting hold of figures isn't necessarily an issue in these days of the internet. But that said, there is something to say for having ready, accessible figures. I'm lucky where I live in Sheffield, in the north of England. We have two wargaming shops in the city. One which stocks pretty much all the plastic box sets from Warlord and Perry's. And the other one can get them ordered in. So it means that if I find myself with a weekend free or a couple of evenings that I didn't think I'd have, then I can nip into town after work, pick up a box of figures, and then come back and get that cracked out over my time off. I don't have to plan so far in advance. So while that's a consideration, it's not necessarily my main consideration, but it's definitely in there. What's more important to me is cost. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm trying to be a cheapskate about this, but it's just a question of I've got only got so much money and I want to get the best bang for my buck. And realistically, we're looking at plastics if we're doing this. Metal figures, great. I've got no problem with metal figures. But you're looking around about £2 plus for an infantryman, 3 4 maybe even £5 for a cavalryman. Uh, so we're looking at plastics. There you're looking 50 to 75p for an infantryman and maybe £1.20, £1.50 for a cavalryman. This comes in with the ease of transport as well. It means that taking it down to the club is going to be a lot easier for me if it's a plastic army. So I'm definitely, definitely leaning towards plastics. Looking around out there, there are three main plastic manufacturers for Napoleonics. You've got Victrix, who do a range of Imperial Guard. They do mid and late French and Peninsula and Waterloo British. They also do Austrian Infantry and Austrian Grenadiers. So that's the range from them. Warlord and Perry's are the other two main ones. And they do pretty much infantry for all the six major nations. They do British, French, Prussians, Russians... Austrians, and I wasn't going to say Spanish so I, I, when I said six, and that's a complete lie because they don't do plastic Spanish. So of the six main nations, they do plastics for five of them. So because there's no plastic Spanish, you can convert them from mid-war French. I, I've seen it done. It's not quite for me, though, so I'm going to discount the Spanish on that one. So we're down to the main core five armies. So Russians... And Austrians, I'm going to discount those straight off the bat as well. Why? Well, they don't have any plastic cavalry. They do have metal cavalry, and there is plastic cavalry announced for the Austrians in early 2020 from the Perrys. But as it stands at the moment, they have no plastic cavalry. For ease of transport, with them being like metal, and for accessibility, again, there's not many shops that stock Perry metals. And for cost, again, they're a lot more expensive than the plastic ones. Still, you know, reasonably priced, but still more expensive than the plastic ones. So because of those three categories, those two armies fulfill none of those when it comes to cavalry. So I'm going to discount. I'm not going to get a new Russian army. I'm not going to get a new Austrian army. So that leaves us with French, Prussians, and uh, British. Similarly to the Russians and the Austrians, the Prussians have no plastic cavalry at the moment. So for the same reasons, I'm going to discount them. Although, an army that I am quite interested in 
is the 1806 Prussian army. Again, there's no plastics out there for them. So that's one perhaps for a future consideration. Not this time, but maybe in the future. So that leaves us with the British and the French. Now, the British, both of those armies, have multiple manufacturers that make them in plastic. Infantry and cavalry. Artillery as well, actually. It's something that I haven't mentioned before. So both of those would be excellent choices. The British, now, I do already have a British army. So I'm going to discount them for that reason. Not obviously, if I didn't have a British army, then there will be you know other factors that come into there. But the problem I've got with the British is not so much a problem with them, but it's what the French is going to enable me to do. So I'll go on to talk about them. Just leave, leave the British sort of with a pin in them. I will come back to them. The French are not only the French. This is the key point, and this is where I'm going to get, end up with in this episode. When I talk about the French, I'm, of course, talking about the armies that fought for Napoleon. So as well as the French, obviously, there's loads of different troops out there. So there's things like the Italian states, some of the German states, the Bavarians, the Kingdom of Naples, the Swiss, the Dutch... All of these cool factions that are all wrapped up in the term French. Now, again, I've already got a French army. I've got a late French army. And I don't really fancy doing more of them. But I do fancy doing an army that can be used by them. So it's something that's not a completely brand new one. It'll fight alongside them. So we're looking at what we call the minor states. Now, the Perries have just brought out two new plastic sets of infantry. I don't own any of them yet. And I'm kind of looking for an excuse to buy them, if I'm honest. Us war gamers, or certainly the ones I know, we like the new shinies, and these are new and shiny, so I would like to get them. I want an excuse to get them. So that limits me even further. So perhaps some Italian states, yes, but things like the Bavarians, well, they're out of it, because Bavarians have a very different uniform to the French. So we're now looking at things like the Italian states, or... Another foreign army that fought for Napoleon, the Poles. And this is where we're going to get down to. Those of you who've seen my favourite regiments video or just heard me wax lyrical in general will know that I absolutely love the Polish Lancers. I think they're the coolest cavalry in the whole of the Napoleonic Wars. So, that sounds like a good reason to look at them. Ah, Tim, I hear you say, you've just discounted three entire armies because they don't have plastic cavalry. There's no plastic Polish cavalry. That's true. For now, the Victrix company have announced that they are bringing out Polish Lancers. I kind of hope that they'd already be out by now, but they're not yet. That's fine. I can wait for those because I can use those Perry French infantry from the mid-war to count to I buy those and I can start on them and I can start painting a Polish army. Now, the Poles had two different types of army. I'm going to go into researching armies in the next episode but there were two different ones you had the duchy of warsaw which was when poland became an independent country and before that they had the vistula legion now the vistula legion was a group of regiments that fought in spain they also fought later in russia as well so they've got spread they can either fight the british or they can fight the austrian russians I mean, uh, you could put them against the Prussians as well. That'd be a bit of a what-if. But yes, yeah, whatever, why not? And that's what wargaming's for, isn't it? We're not recreating history. So, I'm heavily leaning on the Poles. The thing that's absolutely going to clinch it for me is that they are quite a limited army. My pledge for this year, so the thing that... The project I want to get done from start on the 1st of January 2020 to be finished on the 31st of December 2020, is I want to get every regiment in the Vestula Legion painted. Now, not necessarily all the battalions, but my pledge is I want to get two battalions from each Vistula Legion regiment painted. I th I've not fully researched it yet, so that's going to come next for the next video, but I think there's four regiments, perhaps of three battalions. So we're looking at 12 infantry units, and two regiments worth of lancers. So that's the army project that I've got in mind. 
I'm going to approach it from the aspect of not having painted them or anything like that. I might even do some paint along videos as we're going. Let me know if you'd like to see those in the uh, in the comments below. But basically that's where I've come to. So it was a, a thought process of mine. What's drawn me to the period in general? Which armies do I like? And which aspects of those armies do I like? So the Poles are a very small subsection of the French army, but they're the ones that I really look forward to getting done and painted. What I'm going to be doing in the next episode is doing a bit of research and also budgeting out what the army is going to cost me and setting a plan for getting that built and painted over the next year. So thank you very much for listening to me waffle on in this video. We got there in the end and hopefully I'll see you in the next part where we look at planning the army and in the purchasing and painting stages. Thank you very much and goodbye.